for coming this afternoon to this panel after a very, very drastically scaled back meeting of the Commission on the Status of Women to adopt their declaration affirming the 1995 uh, Platform for Action and Declaration adopted at the Fourth World UN Women's Conference in Beijing. I should probably start out by saying my name is Edith Lederer. I'm the Associated Press Chief Correspondent here at the United Nations. And in 1995, I was AP's lead reporter at Beijing. Was anybody else in this room at Beijing? Oh my goodness, that tells me how old I'm getting. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that makes this anniversary um, so important, and I think the affirmation of Beijing so important, is that um, we are living in very different times than the world in 1995. And I was going to ask um, our speakers to not only um, start out giving their reactions, but also to address that particular issue of the world we live in today as opposed to the world in 1995. So I think we're going to start out with Shannon Kowalski, who is the Director of Advocacy and Policy at the International Women's Health Coalition which was a big player at both Beijing and the 1994 UN Population Conference in Cairo that preceded it. Thank you so much, Edie, for hosting us here today. Um, we're, we're thrilled to be able to be here. As, as, she, as Edie said, my name is Shannon Kowalski. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Policy with the International Women's Health Coalition. And IWHC, along with the um, International Planned Parenthood Federation, Women's Environment and Development Organization, Outright Action International, the Youth Coalition for Sexual and Reproductive Rights, um, FEMNET, and the Asia Pacific Forum for Women, Law and Development are co-conveners of the Women's Rights Caucus. Um, and the Women's Rights Caucus is a group of more than 200 organizations from around the world um, that globally, that advocate for the human rights of women, girls, and gender non-conforming people here at the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, so we're here today for a number of things, to share our reflections on this abbreviated Commission on the Status of Women, um, but also to launch the feminist declaration, or rather the declaration that should have been adopted by member states to truly advance gender equality and address some of the most intractable challenges to progress on women's and girls' human rights um, that we face today. So 25 years ago, the message from the Fourth World Conference of, on Women in Beijing, it was my last year of high school, I missed out on it just by hair. <laughs> um, the message was clear, women's rights are human rights. And it was a phrase that finally recognized the humanity and equality of women um, in all of their diversity, but it was also a call to action to realize those rights. And today, in the General Assembly, we had Antonio Guterres um, echo that call, along with UN um, Women Executive Director, Director Pumzilim Lambonguka and many, many member states. Um, yet, as feminists that have been advocating for the implementation of Beijing of the Beijing Declaration and, and Platform for Action for the past 25 years, no, um, there has been incredible progress on women's human rights, but there have also been in some innumerable setbacks on the road to the full realization of those rights. The declaration, or the feminist declaration um, that we're launching today points to some of the significant progress that we have made. And it's, it's important. We've had progress in women's leadership, 
Um, and in some countries, we've reached parity or more than parity um, when it comes to women's political leadership. We have seen a recognition of the burden of unpaid care work, which 25 years ago was something that we were not able to do in Beijing. Um, we've seen progress in reforming the world's abortion laws. We've had more than 50 countries that have made advances um, in that regard, uh, making abortion more available and accessible to people who need them. Um, yet, as the Declaration recognizes, we also live in a moment of profound crisis. And I think this gets to your point, um, Edie. 25 years ago, it was a moment of hope in the world. The Cold War was ending. Um, apartheid had just fallen in South Africa. People were coming together in, in 1995, energized um, with a vision of what a new world order might look like. Um, in the past 25 years, we have seen um, the deepening of a number of crises. Uh, so Anita Naya referenced um, this morning that one of the crises that we're facing is deep inequalities within and between countries, which is really driven by a resurgence in neoliberalism and capitalism and the corporate capture of states. We're seeing the crisis of climate change, which threatens our very survival um, and it has disproportionate impacts on, on women and girls. Um, we're seeing a crisis of health as COVID-19 has really brought to bear. Um, and we're seeing the impacts of that this week with the uh, postponement of the CSW. We hope for a bigger, fuller um, session the way that it is supposed to be with feminists and governments later this year. Um, and what is really clear is that it is women and girls and gender non-conforming people that bear the brunt of the crises that we're facing. Um, and so that results in, for example, increased burdens in unpaid care, paid care work, especially for the women and girls that are uh, uh, caring for communities that are affected by COVID-19, um, but just generally. Um, we see greater mortality um, of women as a result of climate-related uh, disasters. Um, and in and we see increase, cre increases in their experiences of violence. And I would say what's more is we see the impacts, these impacts exacerbated by specific and targeted attacks led by powerful countries and authoritarian leaders and fundamentalist leaders on the human rights of women, girls, and gender nonconforming people. They have been able to harness popular anger about the impacts of these multiple crises as a tool to undermine the progress that has been made on women's human rights and to strip us of our autonomy and our rights to make decisions over our bodies and lives. So this particular CSW, this anniversary, had particular significance for women and girls around the world. The CSW is the one place where feminists from around the world can come together to share, to strategize, to draw strength from each other, um, and most importantly, to push for the accountability of our governments. We were looking forward to governments adopting a strong and bold and ambitious political declaration that would acknowledge the change, the, the need for systemic change and commit to concrete actions to take us forward towards the world of equality that we all want. We are really glad that governments have reaffirmed the importance of the Beijing Platform for Action and subsequent agreements and recommitted to take action to address them. But we rue the lack of vision and most of all the political leadership that's needed to do more, particularly in this moment of crisis. The Feminist Declaration provides that vision. It outlines the concrete and specific steps that governments must take to do, uh, to, must commit to and take in order to push back against the pushback, um, which Antonio Guterres is consistently saying is needed, and to make gender equality more than just a project, but to make it a vision and a reality. So my colleagues, I'm sure, will talk to more about what is covered in the political dec in the feminist declaration. But to highlight a few things, um, it calls upon governments to respect the rights of all individuals to exercise agency over their lives, including their sexualities, identities, and bodies, and to do so free from all types of discrimination, coercion, and violence, and to fully realize sexual and reproductive rights. It. Uh, calls for a focus on women's ability to exercise real power over their environmental, economic, social, political, and cultural structures and assets. Um, it calls upon governments to recognize the rights to work as well as rights at work, ensure universal access to social protection and to gender transformative public services, 
and to recognize, redistribute, and reduce the burden of unpaid care and domestic work. It calls upon governments to urgently tackle climate injustice and ecosystem breakdown through gender responsive and human rights based actions. It calls upon governments to take action to protect the human rights of women, migrant and undocumented workers and to promote and respect women's and girls rights to education throughout the life course at all levels. Um, and finally, it calls for universal access to comprehensive, gender transformative public health care services that are free at the point of care, including a full range of sexual and reproductive health services. So I'll pause there, happy to answer questions and hand it to my colleagues well, to elaborate more. Uh, yeah. Um, our second speaker is Luisa Drummond Veado who is the UN Program Officer for Outright Action International. And after she speaks and our third speaker speaks, we will open the floor to questions. Thank you, Edith, and thank you for having us here today. Uh, and it's really good to talk after Shannon, because Shannon covered so much that I can focus mostly on us queer and LGBTI folks and bodily autonomy and free sexuality in the world. Um, going through what Edith uh, quite asked us in the beginning, in 1995, I was a five-year-old child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I am a child of the democracy in Latin America, and I understand completely where all the women across the globe were in 1995, thinking of a new world, a new possibility, a free world, a democratic world, a world that everyone could participate. Uh, 25 years later, this is so not the reality, but this is the world that we have to dream for and that everyone could be part of, it could contribute for. Um, so considering 25 years post Beijing platform for action, we see in the political declaration that was, a, uh, the political declaration today, uh, it is very important that it mentions all women and girls. It is very important that it mentions the multiple and intersection forms of discrimination that exists. However, a lot of us are still excluded from this political declaration. A lot of our rights are still excluded in this political declaration. From what was mentioned this morning, we don't even have to go to civil society. From what was mentioned this morning from the Secretary General, we live in a male-dominated world. We live in the world where the patriarchy dominates. We live in the world where misogyny ex exists. We looked at states who talked today like Ecuador, Mexico, the Santiago group. We look at the EU. We look at so many countries saying, well, we wanted to include women, peace, and security. We wanted to include sexual and reproductive rights. We wanted to include the right to sexuality to everyone. But that's not reflected in this political declaration. And this is why we, as conveners for the Women's Rights Caucus, together with more than 200 organizations and I don't even know how many have signed, because I, I, I haven't kept track of how many, but a lot of us uh, think that this declaration, the feminist declaration, shouldn't be seen just as an alternative declaration, but the declaration of a world that we want to be part of is a world that we want to fulfill. And the political declaration that was decided today, we have no mention of LBTI women. We have no mention of gender nonconforming people. We are once again invisibilized. We're put aside. It's good that you have all these expressions that were included in, but were never mentioned. In 1995, you could understand maybe that was not the moment. Maybe we are not ready. Maybe the states are just focusing on women's rights. But 25 years later, that excuse is not, no longer possible. We're here, we're queer, and you can't get away from us. LGBTI human rights, well, LGBTI rights are human rights. It's hard for me even to separate the expression. And as much as our sisters did 25 years ago with the lesbian tent, they participated, they were present, they tried to push so hard to be part of the Beijing Platform for Action. We did not achieve to be part of the political declaration, but we're part of the declaration that matters to us, this feminist declaration where every LBTI woman and every gender nonconforming person is included. So I, I, this is a little bit of what I wanted to address, but I also like to make an invitation for everyone in this room who hasn't read the Feminist Declaration to please take a moment, read it, and spread it far 
because that's the world that we want to be part of, an inclusive world for everyone, not just for a few, but for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Koli Butalesi, the National Coordinator for Sisonke South Africa. And maybe you could start by telling everybody what Sisonke South Africa is and does. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've been introduced already. Um, Sisonke is the National Sex Worker Movement um, that was formed in South Africa, me being a founding member of that movement. Um, it is a movement that is calling for adult um, sex work in South Africa to be decriminalized. Okay. Was I too fast? Oh. Short <laughs> the decriminalization of adult sex work. Um, thank you for having me and also to be given this uh, opportunity to be part and parcel of this platform. I feel welcomed because some of the feminist spaces uh, are very much hostile, but you know, I feel home. Thank you so much. And definitely I will, will share the declaration feminist. We'll spread it with the, some of our fellow colleagues out there. Um, we welcome the declaration. I think it's important that um, we are part and parcel of it as, as, as sex workers and uh, from the sex worker movement. And we feel, strongly feel that uh, movement also, it is important that uh, they're inclusive in such spaces so that we can also bring the voice of the marginalized communities out there that they don't actually get to be um, in such spaces. And also the declaration, it, um, it highlights the, uh, decent sex work that, uh, the decent work that it should apply to sex workers as well. And also it calls the government to, to, to recognize the rights, which uh, is the rights that we're calling for when we're advocating for the call for decriminalization. It's not to say that we're calling for special rights, the same uh, basic rights and equal rights that everyone has. So we mostly welcome the declaration. It is also inclusive of our recognized uh, sex workers and also calls for us to be given rights. And I think also part of um, the progress in leadership because together we can make a difference as, as, as feminists. I think it's important that um, we are part and parcel of those spaces and also um, we, it calls the government that he should also recognize us and make sure that you are part and parcel in those spaces. I think that is also important for us because um, if we, I believe that um, majority of people that are in the industry are female and as uh, uh, women. And um, I believe also that he, together we, 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 we work together, we win divided we fall. So I think making this kind of um, a difference and being inclusive in such spaces, spaces and being mean, meaningful uh, in such spaces, it will definitely um, contribute towards the lives of, of marginalized, which are sex workers out there and female at large. And um, I would like to say happy, um, a International Women's Day, belated Women's, Women's Day, because we have not met even with some of the women that we have not seen out there, because we have not met. I think it's important that you acknowledge that, and also the declaration that is taking place at this time around, we acknowledge that. Thank you so much. We'll would engage more uh, in any questions that are coming forward. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to open the floor to um, our UNCA members for any questions. Evelyn? Thanks, Edie. Uh, thanks, everyone there. Uh, Evelyn Leopold. Um, could someone explain what the problem was with 1325? Was it human rights, and who objected to it, and why? People keep flinging the number around all morning. And secondly, the United States was in a different place in 1995. It was the Clinton administration, and human rights are, women's rights are human rights, I believe, was Hillary Clinton who came up with that phrase. So I, I actually would defer to my colleagues who are following the negotiations more closely to talk about 1325. Um, I will say that it, there has been a lot of pushback against including women, peace, and security in commission on the status of women outcomes over the past several years, um, where the government's making the false argument that this is something that's dealt with by the Security Council and doesn't apply in the commission. Um, we push back against that forcefully, women's peace and security 
issues are issues that all of us as feminists deal with on a daily basis. Um, our security um, and our ability to ensure um, our health and well-being is fundamentally linked um, to the crises and conflict that we find ourselves in. And so trying to separate our lives in that way makes absolutely no sense. Um, but there was a, a number of governments that pushed back strongly against inclusion. Russia. 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 <laughs> were, were there others? Do we know? I think Russia was the strongest voice against it. Um, and the United States um, has been a particularly regressive force for gender equality and women's human rights over the past several years. Um, they made a very nice statement this morning, um, talking about how they're champions of equality. Um, however, at the same time that they have been um, promoting women's economic empowerment, for example, they've been taking very strong actions around the world to undermine women's ability to make decisions about their bodies and their sexualities. Um, and so. From day one, this Trump administration has put in place measures like the global gag rule, um, the defunding of the United Nations Population Fund, and others to strip women of not only um, access to abortion services, but also to contraceptives and other life-saving health care. Uh, so the United States has, has um, definitely shifted from the days of 1995 when Hillary Clinton did say women's rights are human rights, borrowing the phrases from um, that phrase from women's movements, um, and ha have now become one of the actors on the world stage that has the most one of the most extreme positions on women's human rights and actively under works to undermine them at the international level. Any other questions, Carla? Yeah, I wait for the microphone. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, I came in late uh, to hear Shannon's. Uh, presentation, what I did hear I thought was very much to the point and incredibly important that you mentioned neoliberal uh, capitalism. So many of these issues were addressed by Naomi Klein in her book The Shock Doctrine. Um, and I have to thank Edie for uh, simplifying the name gender equity gender entity, whatever, to you and women saying that your editor would say what? Anyway, that I did bring up the issue before Michelle Bachelet at a, a women's uh, meeting about with financial independence, women basically have control over their lives. And what's, I, what, what's the question? The question is, uh, it seems as though there's an avoidance of... Um, and then I have to say, why is there an avoidance of the kinds of economic systems which would give women control over their rights? This is going on right now in this country where the one person who would be um, resurrecting some of those values uh, will not be nominated, it seems, because he's a socialist. We're, so, not, we're not doing American politics. No, it's, it's, this is not American, American politics. But it is, um, you seem to indicate that uh, neoliberal capitalism was a very pernicious system. And it's always bothered me that the greatest work on women's rights was written by a man, and that was Engels. Um, that capitalism is based on patriarchy. Patriarchy is based on the suppression of women. So where would you take this? Because it would seem to me that economic empowerment is the most important goal that would free women. And yet, we're in a patriarchal system where women are being pushed back into the three Ks, you know, kinder, kirka, and whatever it was, you know. OK. Thank you, Carla. Would anybody like to take that on? So the um, alternative, the feminist declaration which we're launching addresses some of this, and I think that you named it. We see some of these systems of um, neoliberalism, capitalism, patriarchy as, as interlinked systems of oppression that um, keep women from being able to realize their rights, um, and that 
what we're calling for in the declaration is systemic change that addresses um, how we reform our economies our um, and our societies in order to better realize those rights. Um, but ensuring universal social protection, for example, is, is critical, universal access to um, health services and other public services, universal free education at all levels um, are some of the things that are fundamental towards um, improving society and ensuring that women and girls are able to realize their full potential. A number of other things I, I think um, that it are really critical is also looking at the ways in which um, governments have, have abdicated their responsibility for fulfilling rights by entering into um, public-private partnerships with the private sector um, in ways that uh, put profit over the rights of people. Um, and so we need to push back against the corporate capture of states, which we refer to and which Anita referred to this morning in, in her presentation as well, in order to ensure that governments really are meeting their human rights obligations across the board, and that includes their economic um, and social rights obligations. Finally, um, how are you going to deal with the pushback? Because it's going to be violent if we're talking about systemic change. You know the kinds of oppositions. How are you going to deal with it? Uh, the reality is, is that we're dealing with violence um, every day in in our lives. Um, you know, one in three women experience uh, violence at the hands of an intimate partner. Um, I, I think that unless we're willing to be bold and courageous, then we're not going to be able to see the change that we want to see in the world. Good afternoon. My name is Yasin and Joy. Question for you, because you have short. <laughs> Speech. Um, in, in South Africa, you're talking about South Africa, they have women rights, and what the domestic violence over there, what's going on? Can you tell us a little bit better? I think it, domestic violence, um, it, it, it occurs in, in, in many spaces, in many platforms, intimate partners, with sex workers, in, with individuals, etc. So, um, yes. It, there is rights for, for women, but uh, mostly with the sex workers, they are mostly marginalized because of the criminalization system, and then they are not easily um, as supported in terms of accessing legally facilities and reporting those cases, etc. which is why we are advocating, and we welcome this document, and also happy that it kind of like recognizes uh, and includes the rights of sex workers. So we're hoping that we'll also make use of this document as a tool in order to advocate and fight for change. There's a large number for a single woman. Single mother. It's over there. Do you have a lot of single mother over there? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, there's, there's single yeah. mothers everywhere. <laughs> I'm just not sure because I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with the research of that, but um, I would say mostly sex workers are single parents. Yes, are single mothers. Hi, I'm Kaori Yoshida from Nikkei. Thank you for having this briefing today. Maybe this is more of a question for people who were involved in the negotiations, but would you consider the, the declaration that was adopted today progress in terms of comparing with uh, the one that was handed from the Bureau and the one that was adopted five years ago? I think I was the only one that was here five years ago, and I don't know if um, you all will remember back to that time, but we issued a statement then that was signed by 900 some women's organizations that were um, was condemning the process by which the n political declaration was negotiated five years ago, precisely because it excluded the participation of feminists from around the world, um, and also government representatives from capitals. And I would say the same thing happened this time. Um, and what we have is a political declaration that does some important things. Mm -hmm. It reaffirms the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and, and mm -hmm. some subsequent agreements. It reaffirms, once again, the link between women's rights and gender equality and sustainable development. Um, it lays out some critical areas that um, need to be addressed in order to achieve gender equality. Um, but the reality is, I think in many areas it does fall short of the vision that we want um, for the world and doesn't reflect the kind of bold cur and uh, uh, boldness and courage that is needed at, at this point in time to really um, address women's human rights. So is it progress? Um, 
it's it's important in continuing the momentum towards implementation of Beijing, um, but governments have um, and should do more. Can I? Any, any, you want to, please? Yes. Um, I would say definitely this is progress and it's a step ahead um, because it then gives um, feminist um, and women also an opportunity to hold government accountable in terms of making sure that actually they are bound by the rules and also to make sure that they are recognized the rights of women as every woman. And it also empowers um, feminists and women at large, you know, to have the voice to be able to fight for what is uh, us, like rights in general and basic rights. Rights to work, I would say. I don't see any of the hands, so I'm gonna ask a question. Both um, the Secretary General and the head of the UN Women um, put a lot of hope in young women who are taking the lead in speaking out. And I wonder if all of you, each of you could address um, how you see the Me Too movement and all of its spin-offs and the future of what you see that young women can and will be doing. Why don't we start with you, Louis? Okay, well, for me, the Me Too movement, and then you can go to Ni Una Menos or Ni Una Mas in Latin America, uh, the movements uh, in Africa, in in Asia and everywhere, you see young women coming and using different platforms. Because we grew up in a different world with different platforms, so you get to have a collective of thousands of women in the mm -hmm. hashtag Me Too going on the internet and telling what we all knew but we never talked to each other, that we all suffer violence, that we are all oppressed by the system and we are all oppressed by male figures in our lives. Uh, the difference is that these new platforms create us an, an entire global possibilities, an entire new language. And if it's well used, it creates a great possibility to create coalitions and do what we as a feminist movement do best, is work together. So for me, it's, it's very important and it's very different yet very similar to the feminist movement that happened in, in Beijing, so to say. Um, a lot of people say that there was a gap between these two generations, but I don't see that. I see that there was a transformation on the way that people get together, but the ideas are the same and the fighting is the same. And we as the younger feminists, because I don't think I'm that young, but younger <laughs> feminists, um, we have so much to learn, but we also have a lot to give from what we're doing and learning in this completely different world that we're born in. I think it's incredibly powerful that young feminists are saying, no, no more. This is not the world we want to live in and we're going to change it. Um, and we've seen the incredible power of that in so many places around the world. Um, in Argentina, for example, with the Green Wave um, and their fight for decriminalization of abortion. Or in Mexico right now, where women are striking um, and removing themselves from the streets and social media to show what a world looks like without women. Um, so I think that there's incredible power in what young women and young feminists are doing, um, and it's up to us to work with them to make sure that their visions become reality. Um, what I would like to add, that I would say, um, having such a document in place to refer to, I think it's important because it's a living document that we'll be referring to. And also, I think we are leaders all of us, so what we do, um, we also showing the the grown ups what to do, and uh, and, and 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 being part of um, feminist and within movements, and then we also making sure that we are advocating for change. So the younger ones they learning from us, because now if you've noticed, and a um, lot of women are speaking out on the issues that they face, whether a sex worker, regardless of who you are, people now are coming out. But I think what we need to make sure is that we make sure that the implementation of the documents that are existing, let's make use of that to make sure that we hold the government and we also claim our power as, as women. Um, the civil society is uh, basically hosting two major events to focus on taking Beijing forward. 
One is in Mexico in May. The second one is in Paris in July. And I wonder if each of you would talk about your expectations of what, what's going to happen there and what you're hoping might come out of those forums. Um, I think the expectations with the Generation Equality Forums in, in Mexico and in Paris is a feminist gathering. It's a space that civil society gets to participate completely and gets a voice and gets to sit on the table together with states and other stakeholders to actually come to a compromise of points that can be accomplished and that we can work together to make the world a more feminist and more inclusive world. So I think that the Generation Equality Forums are actually really exciting and an opportunity for us to do things differently. Um, so this is a place where governments together with feminists from around the world um, and other progressive actors, foundations, will sit together to try and envision the world that we want and how to get there. So this is not a place where we're going to be held back by the lights of the United States or Russia who are trying to put roadblocks in, in our way to achieving equality. This is a place where progressive um, people that are committed to a feminist world will come together and, and chart that course for change. So I think that there's p real power in that. Um, I, I think that the potential of the Generation Equality Forums is to shift the power from the hands of, of governments um, into the hands of feminist organizations and movements. I think it's our opportunity for uh, you know, the generation younger than, than Beijing to have our Beijing moment um, and to really learn from each other, um, be ambitious, think uh, about what it is that we can do to actually move the ball forward. So I think that there's huge potential in the Generation Equality Forums. I'm really mm -hmm. excited by the possibility of, of um, getting out of the constraints that we find ourselves in in this place and being able to do more together. Okay, um, I think uh, action, that's what it's needed because we've been, we've been talking, uh, advocating, you know, calling for this. I think it's time, it's time for action that as women we lead and also um, inclusive in feminine spaces because not every feminine space is it's, it's welcoming of, of the sex work community, for an example, and also spaces where it's sex work through stigma um, and presentation of best practice in making sure that uh, we craft um, implementation and laws, whatever change and everything that we do, that would be best for women in this country or in this globally, yes. Are there any last questions? Other yeah, go, go ahead. Thanks. I, I just wanted to uh, ask uh, Shannon and the rest of you, so how will you shift the power from the governments to the people to affect your change? Thanks. That's a really good question. I mean, I think that the way that we're organizing these forums is an um, example in, in of itself. And so it's the governments of France and Mexico that are taking the lead alongside of um, feminist organizations and UN women. And together we are setting the agenda for the forums. Um, we are making sure that we're having some of the most critical conversations that we need. Um, we have worked with um, feminists to identify areas for action. And so we've, we've I, in the process of now, putting together six action coalitions that will focus on gender-based violence, bodily autonomy, and sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, feminist action for climate justice, economic justice and rights, feminist movements and leadership, um, and uh, innovation and technology for gender equality. Um, and I really harbor the hope that the actions, um, at the action coalitions will be able to dedicate and target um, increased resources and most importantly, political will um, behind some of the, the key areas that, have, that really need to be tackled if we're going to drive some of that change that we want to see in the world. And the unique thing about these action coalitions is that it, um, they're going to be partnerships that are made up of different stakeholders. Um, and so governments uh, will be sitting around the table, but so will uh, us um, as equal stakeholders um, and, and decision makers 
will have dedicated seats also for young feminists to be part of the leadership of these action coalitions and helping to define the kind of world that we want to live in and what needs to be happen and what needs to happen to do that. Um, beyond that, the Generation Equality Forums are also a place where we can tackle some things that are really critical to feminist movements. So, for example, how we strengthen accountability mechanisms like the CSW and make them more inclusive and how we make them work for us. Or, um, you know, how we can um, come together as, as feminist movements, um, you know, what have to share lessons and, and strategies about what has worked to push for change in our own countries and, and extrapolate some of those lessons learned for the rest of us. Or, you know, maybe we will be able to get a progressive alliance of member states that are willing to push for, for gender equality and be real champions in places like the UN. Um, so I think there are lots of ways that we can do this. I think we, we um, have a tremendous opportunity before us and it's up to us to take it. Okay, um, I think um, empowerment and uh, um, the share of knowledge, because knowledge is power. You know, if people don't have knowledge and then they wouldn't be able to um, to advocate and also to um, fight for any change and also um, to shift the power to government, it is important that we empower our own community and also to empower us ourselves as women first because there are some other women that are suppressing others and marginalizing other women. So those are some of the things that I strongly believe that um, we need to make sure that we support each other. Also feminists, the existence of feminists and the inclusive of women in those spaces and the movement building, because that's where the voices of the women are gathered together to make sure that they address one goal that they want to achieve a very important spaces. So do you want to say anything on that issue? No. <laughs> I think you covered okay. everything. I'm just thinking okay. everyone. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I think it's been very interesting, and I, like many people here, will be looking forward to seeing what happens in Mexico City, mm -hmm. what happens in Paris, and also what happens when CSW actually holds its annual big meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. That was super.